Welcome back, everybody. Uh, I'm David, your host here at Left Reckoning. Matt is out. I'm finally getting some sun uh, to make up for the fact that he's been trapped inside in that New York winter uh, for the past few months. But we have a really amazing show for you all today. Something I'm a topic I'm really excited to be covering more. As people know, I'm a big uh, nuclear bro, and um, I think that it's something that's really important. And I think that the left should get a lot better at talking about it. Um, and I couldn't think of a better person to bring on the show to do that in depth. Uh, then Maddie Hilly. Uh, Maddie Hilly is the founder and executive director of the campaign for a green nuclear deal. Um, and she's going to be on here to talk a little bit about why nuclear power is so important. Um, thank you so much, uh, Maddie, for joining us on Left Reckoning today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me on. Excited to be here. Yeah, well, we're, I mean, we're stoked to have you. I mean, you know, we've been covering uh, nuclear power um, a lot on this program, but Oftentimes, it's sort of like topic by topic. So I figured, you know, doing a really holistic view of why this is so important is something that I think, you know, our listeners are definitely going to appreciate. And, you know, just talking uh, more broadly, strategy, like electricity is something that is tremendously important. Um, it's what, you know, helps us survive, and keeps the, the house warm um, when it's cold out, and it keeps the house cool when it's hot out, it cooks our food, it performs a lot of very important, um, you know, basic functions of life. And uh, the irony is, right now, we really are facing um, a crisis of not only climate change, but also um, an electricity crisis, like right here in Austin, Texas. Uh, we've been without electricity for large portions of the city for days. And there's something that like, it's just so visceral that this really touches people's everyday life. That I think that on the left, like we need to be taking very seriously how we are proposing maybe getting off of fossil fuels. Um, and, you know, I think that nuclear could be a really big part of that. But you're somebody who's dedicated a tremendous amount of your life and time um, to the subject. And I'm just wondering if you could, you know, broadly explain to somebody who might be on the fence why nuclear itself is such an important technology uh, for us to be able to power our future. The first thing to understand or the first thing I bring up when I'm talking to someone about nuclear is exactly what you said, just how important energy is. Energy is the lifeblood of society. Increasing energy consumption has coincided with increasing outcomes for education, healthcare, democracy, prosperity, security. So the question is, how do we meet our energy needs without without harming nature or while minimizing our impact on the environment. And traditionally, particularly on the left, the conventional wisdom has been we need to produce and consume less energy. And some people call that degrowth. And given the relationships that I just outlined of positive societal outcomes, you have to wonder what would we be reversing or what would we be sacrificing if we decided to reverse that trend. And that's not to even mention the 13% of the world that doesn't have any electricity access. And fortunately, we don't need to do that experiment because we are already seeing that countries are able to undergo economic growth while reducing their emissions on absolute terms. And it's a little bit jargony, but that's called decoupling. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea is that through abundant affordable, clean energy, we can reduce our environmental footprint. So we can make recycling more economical to reduce our need for raw materials. We can desalinate water and reclaim wastewater to protect our aquifers. We can grow more food on less land. So where does nuclear fit into all of this? The key to decoupling is abundant, clean, affordable power. And that's exactly what nuclear provides. Nuclear is the closest thing that we get as possible when it comes to energy to a free lunch. Like fossil fuels, it can produce nation scale electricity year round, regardless of the time of day or season. But unlike fossil fuels, it does so without emitting greenhouse gas emissions or harmful air pollutants that impact human health. So from an environmentalist standpoint, nuclear truly is the gold standard. Mm -hmm. No, and like, I mean, you know, you, you brought up degrowth. And I, I think what, what's so frustrating to me about that whole gambit that folks are getting out there is like, well, we need to sacrifice certain things. And like, by the way, let's be clear about what we're talking about sacrificing, um, you know, like the ability, again, to like 
have like very good climates for people to thrive in inside their homes. Things that are like absolutely critical for things like, you know, social justice. Like think, you know, a lot of times decoders are people attack things like washing machines or dishwashers. <sighs> And the amount of like kind of like tedious labor that has been eradicated by the, these machines is truly like a world historic uh, benefit for just the daily life of people. And that's something that if you're a leftist or a socialist or progressive, you should want to see being expanded. And the nice thing is, is that we don't have to make the sacrifice between using elec less electricity at home and the environment because something like nuclear power can provide tremendous amounts of electricity, um, cheap and abundant uh, for, for the population. Totally. I mean, I I really think that a more just, more equitable society is one with stable, affordable electricity. And anything that makes energy more expensive automatically incentivizes energy austerity and increases poverty. So energy mm -hmm. should be a key issue for anyone who's concerned about um, helping the working class and making sure to alleviate poverty. And we'll talk in a little bit about how we want to ramp this up. But I think that sometimes mm -hmm. people um, miss one of like the larger criticisms that people who are for nuclear make of some of the other renewable energy sources. And like, I was just wondering if you could sort of help people understand this concept of like intermittency, right? Because I think a lot of people mm -hmm. don't understand what when we say like, when you say that, like, we, you can get electricity anytime under any conditions. Um, people might not understand what exactly, you know, you, you're talking about there, what the risk is. Right. So society, like the grid is a balancing act where supply needs to be matched with demand at every second, almost exactly. So the issue with renewables is that the sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing. So you need to be ready. And we've seen on grids that even have 30% solar and wind, that they can go to zero almost mm -hmm. instantaneously. So you need to be ready to meet the needs of the grid at any given moment. So that's why nuclear is great because it substitutes directly for fossil fuels. It's dispatchable, which means we can ramp it up when we need more of it and make less when we don't need more of it. It's reliable. So like I said, regardless of time of day, season, it's actually more resilient than our fossil fuel infrastructure. But renewables do not substitute directly for fossil fuels. And that's because, again, you have this intermittency. Sun doesn't always shine. Wind doesn't always blow. So you would need to either have backup capacity built um, a lot of storage, although right now we don't have anything that would be, you know, turn day mm -hmm. into night, let alone winter into summer, and a lot of transmission to accommodate that. And like I said, anything that makes electricity excessively expensive is increases energy austerity or incentivizes energy austerity and increases the burden on the working class. So that's sort of how the technology choices that we make to decarbonize are inseparable from the idea of a just transition and what's actually best to meet the needs of society. And like, again, to like the transmission thing, I think people miss as well. Like obviously in Texas, we're, we're blessed with the sense of, in, in the sense of like solar and wind, that there's a lot of parts of like West Texas that are very, um, you know, they're, they're, they're very ideal for building up those kind of systems there. But the vast majority of the state lives in the Texas Triangle, which means you act, have to get the electricity from those systems across a big ass state um, to a place like Austin or Dallas or Houston. And then if you want to talk on the national level, you know, people talk about, you know, Western parts of, of, of the country being able to sort of produce a lot of electricity. Again, you have to transmit it versus something like nuclear. Um, what you can put into, you know, has has a lot more areas where you're able to put it into. But I want to talk um, more in a little bit about, you know, um, some of the benefits for working people and some of the ways we would like to see this get ramped up. But I feel like you can't really have a conversation, a general conversation um, about nuclear power without sort of speaking to some of the general concerns, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, you know, so, some of these systems can seem very complicated or foreign or quote unquote unnatural, despite the fact that these are, um, you know, that, that, uh, this is something that does occur in nature. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, and just like speaking from, you know, my personal experience, and I know a lot of people on the left, like the default position is to be anti-nuclear power. And I think there's probably history for that because of the association with nuclear weapons. We don't need to jump into that history. I want to focus more on, on the science here. Um, but, you mm -hmm. know, I was somebody who was, a, who was against nuclear power for a long time until I started talking to people who knew more than me when I started talking to scientists and I started understanding these systems. So um, I was wondering if we could maybe walk through some of these kind of common questions or concerns that people have. And, you know, I think, we, you know, it's fair that we like answer these. But, um, you know, I don't want to exhaust the entire conversation on these because sometimes it can be, I don't know, a bit of a distraction. And we've missed the positive case for nuclear for always on the defensive. But the first one I want to start with is the one that I've been getting the most of lately, which is this question of waste. And I think a lot of people misunderstand waste. I know you've said before on, on other programs like the Jackman Show, I mean, there's always this kind of understanding of this like green goo, like from the Simpsons <laughs> is what is produced in a nuclear plant. I mean, could you explain one, what nuclear waste is and two, um, that like the kind of concerns and questions people have about storage and how to process and deal with this waste oftentimes aren't really reflective of like the reality of people who are actually um, in this industry? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I left college with an environmental science degree and focused on energy and had no idea what nuclear waste looked like. So I'm never surprised when people don't know. So I love, I do carry around a picture of a big fuel assembly <laughs> and dry cask storage with me because I think once you take it from the imaginary spot into the real world, it's so much less scary. So nuclear fuel is just a bunch of little uranium pellets about the size of the tip of your pinky stacked up into a long rod. And then a bunch of those rods are bundled together to make a fuel assembly. And that's what gets put into the reactor, cooks for some time, and then after three, five years gets pulled out and allowed to cool. And so when we talk about nuclear waste, it's just that, that spent nuclear fuel. And so currently what we do in the U.S. is we let that cool in cooling ponds, so big pools of water. And then once that's done, we use cranes to put them into what are called dry casks, but basically just imagine big steel and concrete containers. And so the spent fuel goes in there. It sits on site about like a fraction of a parking lot. You can think of a basketball court. And in the U.S., this, this style of waste management has a 100% perfect safety record. No one has ever been harmed by the waste. No one has, you know, had any, like, it's, it's a perfect system. From an environmentalist perspective, the only issue that I have is that when that fuel is done in the reactor, We've only used about 5% of the potential energy in that uranium. Mm. So in other countries like Japan and France and Russia, they actually recycle their waste to create new fuel. And so that's the problem I have with proposals that are like, oh, the waste is so uniquely dangerous that we need to bury it underground. We would spend so much money to prevent zero cancers, save zero lives, prevent zero hassle. And in fact, we would make it harder to get our next generation nuclear fuel. Mm. So it's perfect right where it is. You can, I've been to a bunch of dry cask storage sites. You can hug it. I mean, most of the utility utilities require some convincing to let you hug it, <laughs> but uh, it has happened. Um, so that's how we manage waste. And the idea that it's uniquely dangerous just isn't true. In fact, in the Netherlands, they've turned their central waste facility into a museum that's open to the public. So that's kind of my dream where these communities that have nuclear plants that have waste are allowed to like have local artists paint beautiful murals on it, make it a public park, but mm -hmm. allow people to see it. And I think you'll find that very quickly people are okay with the waste being there. No, there's there's a couple more that I wanted to jump into, but like, you know, again, to be really clear, I mean, do you think that sometimes the way that like, you know, the idea of, for example, like we need to bury all of our nuclear waste, like deep, deep, deep in the earth only adds to the kind of general feeling that it's extremely dangerous. When from my understanding of my personal feelings on this, I mean, 
that seems like something that you could do to sort of like calm people down, like don't be worried about this when we should just be making the positive case that this is very, very safe and this is nothing to be worried about in your community. And I love the the art museum idea of just sort of inviting the public to be around this and understand that this is a perfectly safe thing to have in your community. Yeah, I mean, I think it totally reinforces the idea. I, if someone tells me, hey, it's it's totally fine. We just need to bury this thing super deeply underground so that no one can ever mm-hmm. get to it and put a bunch of signs so that in the if an apocalypse happens, future generations never do- like it's so crazy that it's like, well, God, we shouldn't even mess with that when that's just so far removed from what's actually true about the waste. I really do think the only p- people say, oh, nuclear, the nuclear waste problem. The only yeah. problem it has is that people think it has a problem and it just doesn't. And like, again, as you're saying, like the potential of recycling is is like an incredible one that uh, it's a shame that we're not utilizing more. Um, another kind of common, you know, general concern is like, well, I don't want to live next to a nuclear plant because that's going to mean that I'm going to become irradiated and get all these kind of diseases. I mean, um, you know, what would you say to somebody who had that kind of level of fear about living next to a or next to or near a near plant? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the understand i think a lot of the understanding of radiation is sort of paradoxical where we see it as something that's an acute exposure that if you're not careful you may come in contact with Mm -hmm. when we are awash in ionizing radiation every day from space from the ground from foods we eat um it's seen as unnatural something that comes from a nuclear plant that is like doesn't occur in nature which like you said, does actually, fission does occur in nature when most of the radiation that we are exposed to is natural. And then people think it's mysterious that because it's odorless and tasteless, we don't know what could, you know, it could shrink you, it could make you huge, kind of that sci-fi, when really we know more about the human health impacts of ionizing radiation than almost any other hazardous agent. So, with this gulf in public perception and what's true, are we just screwed? Like, are we just destined to not be able to manage radiation risk? Well, no, we do it every day in doctors, offices, and hospitals around Mm -hmm. the world. We understand that small doses that come from diagnostic tests, which are on the same order of magnitude, if not greater than the doses we're talking about with nuclear workers, I mean, way higher than living near a nuclear plant. Mm -hmm. We know that that's the little bit of increase in risk of cancer far down the line is well worth the information that gives. And in the cases of treating tumors and cancers, even high doses of radiation is worth it. So it's really, again, this, this public perception issue that somehow radiation from nuclear is uniquely dangerous and we need to avoid it at all costs. I think sometimes in a very technical sector, we get bogged down on the details. Like pro-nuclear activists love to argue about LNT and like what's the exact model for like describing health impacts of radiation because they think if we can debunk the model, we're just going to have a massive nuclear build out. Either way, it's so small, who cares? And that Mm. message just gets totally missed. Putting radiation into context is so critical, and the industry has been absolute dog shit. Sorry, can I say dog shit? No, that's fine. That's fine. It's been very bad at it. (laughs) And uh, it's something that communicators are kind of stepping up to the plate to do. No, and I think it's really important, you know, you know, we have had Lee Phillips on the show a lot, like, you know, just talking about the regular, the regular experience that we all have with radiation. You know, mm-hmm. if you're on a plane, you're going to be exposed to some levels of radiation. Hell, uh, you know, my, my good friend and co-host Matt Leck, who sometimes mm-hmm. has a big glass of milk, like he gets exposed to, to radiation lump through that. It's like, it's something that is naturally occurring. There are levels of, of radiation just, just naturally occurring in the world around you. And again, and like, are there certain levels of, of radiation that are dangerous? Yes. Um, but is it something that you're going to be experiencing living next to like a nuclear facility? No. And I, I will say that, like, I think that it's as somebody who is an advocate for nuclear power now, it's like, 
um, I think that there needs to be a lot more work done to sort of debunk and dispel a lot of these, um, you know, worries that people have. But I would also say if you are somebody who's skeptical about this, um, just look at the nuclear industry itself. Like it takes all of these concerns like almost too um, seriously to where it actually hurts our ability to build out nuclear power, right? This is not something that like you from the outside are the first person to sort of think that like I'm worried about radiation. It's like the nuclear industry and even advocates are talking about this constantly. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, that's another thing where a lot of advocates say, oh, we're like if nuclear were held to the same standards of coal and natural gas, then we could build like they would be way mm -hmm. less regulated. And I understand where they're, where they're coming from. But at the same time, I, I went to Bruce Power, the plant in Ontario, and met a former coal worker who worked at North America's largest coal plant who became a nuclear operator. It's an amazing story mm -hmm. about of a fossil diffusion transition. And he said, you know, I knew when I went to work at the coal plant that I was killing myself, like that there I was increasing my risk of disease, that I would die early if I stayed here forever. And I come home every day from the nuclear plant to my kids, knowing that that's a guarantee that when I go to work, I'm coming home. I am, I mean, yes, it's annoying all of the precautions, but I'm safe. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yes, that's true. It's, I mean, the, the hoops they jump through are insane, but I mean, that's a great outcome is no, no nuclear plant has ever gotten close to the line of regulation that the NRC and EPA said, and workers are much safer and can be confident going to work because of it. Could you talk a little bit about the difference um, in, in, um, in terms of like human mortality in, in different forms of electricity production, like nuclear compared to coal or all these other systems. I mean, nuclear is like far and away one of the safest ways to produce electricity uh, on the planet. Absolutely. And I, I always feel a little weird. Um, I know a lot of nuclear advocates cite like, you know, 7 million people die prematurely every year from fossil, from just mm -hmm. typical fossil fuel usage. And I understand where they're coming from because all else equal, yes, fossil fuels are far more dangerous because they emit harmful pollutants that we breathe in. But if it, you know, if the question is, is there energy or not, there's no question oops, that um, fossil fuels, having that energy from fossil fuels has had far more health outcomes and so positive societal outcomes than if we were to get rid of that. But if you're just talking about on an equal playing field, where is it coming from? Nuclear has an incredible safety record. In the U.S., it's perfect. Really, there's one, you know, one. Well, actually, let's just walk through the accidents. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Yes, there are three accidents that we think of that always come up when it comes mm -hmm. to nuclear power. The first, Three Mile Island in the U.S., a partial meltdown in Pennsylvania, zero people died. If you didn't evacuate and you lived within the radius of that plant, you got less the or the exposure of about an x-ray, but over a much longer time than an x-ray. So very little would have ex negligent health impacts, no environmental impacts, no other. I mean, it was a non-issue, except that the industry had such horrible communications that it freaked people out and made it seem like there was a really big issue. The next is Chernobyl. And this is what people tend to think about mm -hmm. when they think of worst case, what a worst case scenario nuclear meltdown looks like. This was it. It was an exposed reactor, like core exposed to the environment, on fire, spewing radioactive particles. I mean, my God, I cannot imagine living through it. But we have the benefit of looking at the accident in hindsight after it's been studied for decades. And the UN health report on Chernobyl says that three people died, three workers died as a result of the initial explosion. 28 firefighters died of acute radiation syndrome. And 15 people died prematurely of thyroid cancer in the first 25 years after the accident. So with the helicopter crash, 50 deaths. It also says that there could be 145 additional deaths from thyroid cancer, but these aren't immediate. This is like someone who might die at 70 versus 80. 
And Dr. Jerry Thomas of the Chernobyl Tissue Bank just says, based on these case histories of the patients, that number is probably on the very high end. They're just not seeing these cancers. There were no increases any other type of cancer, no effect on infant mortality or malformations or fertility, nothing. Um, and so 50 deaths up to possible 200. Chernobyl doesn't even break into the top five energy accidents of the 1980s. Hmm. Um, and then Fukushima, two workers died when they drowned in the basement because of the tsunami, but no one died from radiation from Fukushima. Um, so you're talking about an incredibly small 50 to 100 or 50 to 200 ish deaths over the commercial nuclear power industry and an incredible amount of power because nuclear is so energy dense. Mm -hmm. So when you get the deaths per terawatt hour, it's so tiny um, that even, you know, it's it's on on par with solar and wind, which are kind of a lot harder to track, especially solar. Most of the deaths come from installation. Think mm -hmm. about like it's really yeah. rooftop mm -hmm. falls or like electrocution, which don't really get counted in the same way. So it's hard to tell. But either way, these are all so small that, you know, the question is, which can reliably power society or not? No, I mean, I really appreciate you you going through that because like, you know, one, it's like, the, I think it's important to like take those events seriously and to talk about how to avoid them. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I do think that like sprinting too quickly there f ignores the conversation that is really important to understand what is the risk that we're trying to avoid, right? Like Chernobyl and Fukushima, let's say, being like the worst in in, in, in history. What is like the, the consequence here? It's bad. We don't want to see that happen. But again, like the imagining of like, you know, a fallout style like hellscape is not really accurate to like what the risks here. So like we want to avoid them. There's a lot tremendous amounts of work in the industry to avoid them a lot. As you were saying, like this has been studied immensely. Protocols have been put in place to avoid the kind of things that that, that cause those the, those events. Um, but again, like understanding is like, yes, we take them seriously. Here are the things we're trying to do to avoid them. But also here is what happened in the worst case scenario, because I think when you let people imagine, we're going to imagine the, the craziest you know, sequence of events, um, you know, as, as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, I don't want to be flippant and just say mm -hmm. like Chernobyl, who cares? Because I, like I said, I can't imagine having lived through those accidents when there was not a lot of information coming from the authorities in any of those cases. There was a panic, you know, nuclear is still a relatively new technology. So it, it, I do think it's better to be cautious and take precautions, especially when you're not sure. But then once the accident is over, and again, we have the benefit of hindsight, it's important to really put those into perspective. And so what you see from these accidents is that even in the worst case scenario, the human health impacts and environmental impacts of nuclear power are just so small. And then mm -hmm. when you compare that to the enormous benefits, I mean, it's a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, um, let's talk about some of the benefits. I think, you know, and actually if, you know, you, we could talk about this, this letter, you could send them to me if you don't have any that come to mind. If somebody was, feels like they need to hear it from somebody else or look into these mm -hmm. things, are there any resources that you might suggest people to learn a little bit more about like the safety of, of, of these processes? I have a ton of information on my Twitter and my Substack, but there's also great information uh, at the World Nuclear Association website. Mm -hmm. Now, some people, you know, feel like they can't trust that because it's an industry association, but it's, you know, completely cited from the UN, World Health Organization. It's all right there. So I would start there as a resource. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm hopefully working on something that is acts as a repository for all of this. So people don't have to dig through technical reports or industry websites to get it for themselves. Excellent. Well, we'll put those, those links um, in the show notes for folks who are listening live, but mm -hmm. let's talk about some of the exciting stuff, right? So we're at this moment right now. Um, 
where you know we are facing a climate crisis there's a lot of conversation about what we need to do and we know that like um you know we we do need to mitigate the the levels of, of fossil fuels that we're burning to produce electricity in the united states in particular um you know we we had a period where we were building out um a lot of, of nuclear facilities and that's you know ground to a halt for the most part i mean sitting here right now february 2023 what are some of the steps that we really need to be pushing forward, you know, um, to try to get more nuclear power? And also, if you could talk a little bit about the work y'all are doing at the cam campaign for a, new, a green nuclear deal. Yeah. So I think we, in the past year, basically since the onset of the energy crisis, we've are solidly done with step one, which is recognizing that we need a plan for nuclear. I mm -hmm. think the volatility of fossil fuels, the invasion of Ukraine, what's happening in Europe has scared politicians in the U.S. And luckily, we have abundant natural gas. We have coal. We have a lot of room for error. But if we are going to meet our decarbonization targets, we need a plan for nuclear. We need to have that solid backbone of clean electricity for our decarbonization. So that's step one, recognition. But there's a long way between there and, you know, a France or 1970s USA style build out of nuclear power. And I think it could work in a lot of different ways. You know, we've seen it, nuclear power deployed publicly, either in France or through the TVA. We've mm -hmm. seen it done by private utilities, often with strong government backing. There's a number of different models that we can pull from, but throughout the history of the industry, there have been key, um, key elements to all successful nuclear programs. And I think the two really big ones that would be next for us would be the commitment to a built out. Mm -hmm. So we can't afford to just build one more nuclear power plant in this country. We can afford to build 100 more, even better, 200 more, but we can't do one-off projects. We know that nuclear costs are brought down by building over and over, by gaining experience, by having established supply chains. And then that gets into the second thing, which is that the most successful nuclear programs have really have really centered around one or two standardized designs. So right now in the US, we have a lot of different reactor companies and designs and advanced reactors. And, you know, we're kind of treating it like throwing spaghetti against the <laughs> wall to see what sticks. But really what's important is what do you have experience building hit stick with it and build it over and over again the actual design i know this sounds weird but i've i've talked to engineers about this the actual design is less important than the decision to stick with the design so that's why vogel in my opinion at first was a disaster you picked a mm -hmm. brand new design it's no wonder it's way over budget and behind schedule but now we have this workforce We've had the growing pains of building a mega nuclear project, and we have we're going to waste it unless we commit to building out more AP one thousands, training up more crews, using that experience that we learned to build more AP one thousands. So, you know, I, I this is not like from any particular wonky technology pre like preference, mm -hmm. and I am excited about things like smaller reactors to repower coal plants. But I think if we're really serious, it's going to require um, a level of government involvement, mainly on planning and coordinating mm -hmm. this build out that it's hard to say if we're ready for or, you know, it's hard to know if that will be practical anytime soon. I mean, in my opinion, we need to, you know, to get this out by whatever sort of is available to us. My preference would be to have, you know, these things be federally funded um, and to build out more TVA style um, stuff. I think uh, my friend Matt Huber and Fred Stafford have a big piece coming out on that soon. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, because one of the big criticisms outside of the kind of um, other arguments is that, you know, nuclear power is expensive and it costs a decent amount to start up. But as you were saying, it's like anything. 
um, you know, like the first cars were very expensive to produce, but then once you're able to mass produce them, it becomes a lot easier to do so. And if you think about what it takes to build a, a new nuclear plant today, you got to train the engineers, you got to find the sourcing, you got to build the plants, you got to figure all this uh, kind of stuff. And if we're doing it on a mass scale, these costs um, go down significantly. But um, I wanted to talk like... Because I, I'm curious what you think about the the small modular reactors, right? These these smaller um, nuclear plants that you can, as you were saying, just plop down um, into you know a coal plant because they're already hooked up um, mm -hmm. to 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 the grid. I mean, one thing that I think is really exciting about this is these kind of concepts of of a just transition, right? Like a lot of the labor and expertise that went into powering and utilizing fossil fuels um, could be translated with some level of training over into power nuclear. And it's one of those things where to those communities that, you know, um, you know, we all know the problem with fossil fuels, but at the same time, like we had electricity in this country that like was incredibly important historically, economically, and culturally to people. And, you know, to take to those communities where, you know, they're being told, okay, but those jobs are going to go away. Say, thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing to power the society. Here's how we can bring this into the future. And, you know, this is why we really, really need you. I think it's something that's very, very politically viable. I'm curious if, if you have any thoughts on that. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't have said it better. That's what, you know, you asked about what Campaign for a Green Nuclear Deal is doing. Right now, I'm based in Chicago, and we're working really hard to lift the nuclear moratorium mm -hmm. in Illinois. And it's crazy, right? This is the most nuclear-powered state in the nation. And 90% of our clean electricity is nuclear. It's over half of the state's total electricity we already have the strong so it's 90 percent of chicago it's 90 percent of our carbon free electricity okay, yeah, and yeah. about half of the state's electricity so for people who we have a lot of listeners in chicago like if you're living in chicago you're benefiting from the system already and you don't need to be uh scared about talking about building it out anyway <laughs> right i mean and now our nuclear plans have given customers a uh, $1 billion rebate in the mm -hmm. past year, thanks to policy we got included in the 2021 energy bill. So you can be even more vocal about it now because people are get, seeing a little line item that's saving them money every month. Um, but, but we still have our second largest source of power is coal. And so a lot of downstate is extremely skeptical of what's coming out of Springfield with regards to our energy transition. We're mm -hmm. saying we need to shut off three Hoover Dams worth of coal in the next seven years. So your plants and your jobs and the economic engines of your towns are going to be shut down. And they don't really have a plan for replacing those jobs. Just like renewables don't replace fossil fuels like for like, Renewable jobs do not place fo replace fossil fuel jobs like for like. We mm -hmm. don't produce most of the solar and wind in the U.S. That gets produced abroad. So really you have installation. And those jobs are temporary and often low wage. They're located outside of the communities. Mm -hmm. These are not major sources of tax revenues for communities. So how do you expect to get people on board with a massive decarbonization effort if you're taking away their livelihoods. Whereas with coal to nuclear, you can say, we want to allow you to maintain your purpose. We want you to keep being an energy community. We want to retrain so that you can maintain jobs in your communities. We're going to give you an even better tax base. You know, mm -hmm. these are generational jobs. This is a long-term strategy. So I think it's a really winning message on the left. And now it's more like convincing kind of older <laughs> centrist Democrats that it's okay to be for nuclear now and that the winds are changing and it's time to get on board. But I'm curious, um, you know, like, so I remember when Bernie put put out the, the plan for a Green New Deal being very excited. And we had Matt Huber on the program uh, last week to sort of talk about what the after effects of the Green New Deal were. And like, there was a lot in it that was very exciting. Um, but I think, you know, one of the most clear examples of why it wasn't successful in the end um, was that, you know, it really got held up and heralded by like a kind of NGO, green left group of people. And the union buy-in was really, really limited. 
I'm curious, like if, if you have any thoughts on like the, the, the role for, for union and organized labor and sort of pushing for a, a green nuclear deal. I mean, it was interesting because in the battle for over that energy legislation that I was just talking about in Illinois, one of the issues was that two Illinois nuclear plants were going to be closed prematurely because mm -hmm. they were just getting outcompete in the market by historically cheap natural gas and it heavily subsidized renewables. So the unions came out en masse to just support nuclear power. Mm -hmm. And you know, in, in attending their rallies and working with the leadership, I asked, you know, is this something that you think that your workers, your members in coal communities would support? And they said, absolutely. They wish they had the nuclear jobs because they know it's an automatic 20% wage bump. Mm -hmm. They know how safe these plants are. They know how good the schools in the communities that have nuclear plants are. So I really think there's a huge political block that the left is ignoring. And nuclear could be that common ground where it brings together the working class, you know, the right who may not care as much about combating climate change, but really cares about energy security and bringing back big industry. And I don't know. I think I think the unions where the unions continue to be strong. Unfortunately, the unions just are not what they used mm -hmm. to be. They've been really eroded and it's quite sad. But in a place like Illinois, that is the only reason we've been so successful at protecting our nuclear power is because of those unions. And I think that's those unions are why we are going to also lead the nation in deploying new nuclear power. No, I mean, uh, you know, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, just on the level of, of jobs for communities, like regardless of its of its truthfulness, I know, you know, there are different interpretations of the, of the history of, of, of Texas and oil, but like for working class families, like there is this kind of understand this is a job you can get and it, you can take care of yourself. You can take care of your family. Again, the oil industry is very, very predatory. And we know all, all of that history, but even just in, in people's minds, being able to sort of speak to that in the level of saying like, here's the future, um, you know, um, industry, power industry, energy industry. And, you know, it provides not only, um, you know, abundant energy for folks, but as you were saying, permanent jobs, because when I talk to, to friends right. in the, in the electric, electrical industry or IBEW members, you know, they say all the time about, you know, one of the big things that's really frustrating about all the, the solar deployment is the jobs pay like shit. Um, they're really dangerous. And oftentimes you're getting paid per panel. And what that means for you as a worker is like, you're trying to put on as many panels as possible. Oftentimes people go out there by themselves, which is just like logistically really dangerous, right. um, you know, because they're, they're getting a pittance for this kind of thing. And there's this green halo around the industry that has sort of allowed it to, you know, do the same kind of stuff that all the other extractive industries do. And, and, and nuclear has a potential to really be something that's permanent, high paying, um, and, and, uh, you know, can support a, like a large community. So you don't see these towns sort of just completely get eroded and disappear and everyone has to leave. Um, you right. know, when the and, times change. and that's a beautiful thing about nuclear is it's a lot of highly skilled trades mm -hmm. and, it's a lot of the jobs at the nuclear plant don't require a college degree. So nuclear operator is one of the highest paying jobs you can get and you can have a high school diploma. In fact, 60% of nuclear operators in the U.S. don't have a college degree. So if we're mm -hmm. seeing increasingly more commentary about, you know, how useful are degrees for making your way up in the world, nuclear is one way that you can, you know, the Simpsons got it right in this respect <laughs> yeah. that through a union back job in clean energy, you can support your husband or wife, your children, have a home in the community and come home safely every day. So I think that's a vision that's worth fighting for. And I'll just say to the audience here, you know, we're always having these debates on the left. It's like, how do we change the composition of people who consider themselves to be on the left or be socialists or be progressives, right? Because it does trend one way um, on the education scale. This is a policy that we can all get behind, that we can say with a straight face, with facts behind us, this is a job that is investing in our future in terms of climate change and also 
directly investing in working class communities, providing a higher standard of living for working people. And I think that the, the argument is, is as clear as day. I know we've went a little bit over, but I do have two quick ones for you, if that's OK. Totally. Got all, all the right. time in the world. Well, um, I mean, there's there's more we're not going to be able to get to today. It just means we'll have to get you on again soon to do more. But um, the first one I wanted to ask you um, is this, is that I'm trying not to be depressing, but there's a lot of stuff out there that is bleak, right? <laughs> Um, yes. You know, you do, as you noted at the very beginning, like you look at like the history of a country like France, like that provides like a model for something like green growth, right? Where you can have economic mm -hmm. development and have it not be attached to the consumption of more and more fossil fuels. Something the degrowthers like refuse to reckon with, that there is like a history of, of this um, in a country that a lot of lefties love to, to praise for other reasons, but for nuclear, right. for some reason not. Um, mm -hmm. But we've seen what's been happening with these pushes in Germany with what happened in New York City, what happens for the most part when they decommission these nuclear plants? I mean, it is unambiguous. Everywhere that nuclear is shut down, emissions go up and reliance on fossil fuels increases. I mean, no one has spent more on an energy transition than Germany. Through 2025, I think they will have spent about 580 billion US dollars on renewables, storage, transmission. And they this year have burned more fossil fuels than, or last year burned more fossil fuels than any year since 2018. Their emissions are stagnant and they're not even close to as clean as France's while France has been, you know, destroying its nuclear fleet for the past 20 years, which is a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. But France is still eight times cleaner than German electricity for roughly half the cost. Mm -hmm. So and, and Indian Point, same example, except even more dangerous because you close down a plant, you know, the arguably the heart of America, New York City, right there at a choke point for energy. Um, and we're seeing in New England as a result of other closures that now oil is suddenly making a big resurgence on the grid. So I think we've, we're, we're in a different position than we were two years ago. I think it's that recognition of nuclear's importance. And we've seen the Biden administration and other government agencies act in a way to signal our, this new commitment to nuclear. And we've seen Diablo Canyon is, mm -hmm. you know, that's still fraught. They're still working out the kinks. But politicians voted to save Diablo Canyon. Politicians in Illinois voted to save their nuclear plants. But like you said, it gets tiring being on the back foot. Yeah. Someone's got to articulate a vision for, okay, it's not enough to just continue to wean off of past achievements. How do we do that again? How do we build something that will that future generations can continue to benefit from? And look, I'm just going to say this, you know, for people on the left, it's like, we got to be really smart here because if the green left and this movement keeps on lining up against the uh, union unions and organized labor, I mean, it's a bad, bad strategy for the kind of things that we want to achieve. Um, the last question um, I have for you is, is a little close to home, um, mm -hmm. but in North Texas uh, Comanche Peak nuclear power plant, its licenses are set to expire in 2030 and 2023 um, for its two mm -hmm. nuclear units. Um, there's a growing push. I don't know about how significant or long lasting it will be, but I've been seeing enough of it to talk about it, um, to try to push them to not renew these licenses. And, you know, there's been reporters going out talking to folks, a classic story. They talk to a farmer who's very worried about living near a nuclear plant. If you had the opportunity to talk to, you know, a nice fellow from North Texas who had concerns and was thinking that they should maybe try to push to not renew these licenses. I mean, we've been sort of making it through other thing, but what kind of case would you make to them about why it's so critical um, for us to be making sure that we keep these plants online and hopefully expanding them? Well, I would make a, an argument of self-interest and everywhere that we've seen nuclear power plants close prematurely, it has been extremely devastating to the local areas, the towns, the communities that hosted them. So, for example, north of me in Zion, Illinois, they lost their nuclear plant in 1998. And that was a yearly annual income loss of $20 million. 
So, you know, you drive up there and there are empty businesses, empty storefronts, abandoned strip malls. Property taxes have more than doubled. About two thirds of the single family homes are now rented out. Many people have moved out of Zion and they just describe the the cycle that's happened where businesses are driven away by high taxes, which increases taxes, and they don't know how to get out from under that. And even more recently, in 2014, Vernon, Vermont, lost the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant. And it was devastating. I mean, their emissions, Vermont's emissions, have increased twice as much as the rest of the nation since that time. And they had to have their town budget. They lost you know, they used to have nuclear engineers that would work as substitute teachers and tutors at their public schools. That was gone. So, you know, again, set aside the environment, set aside the energy security, set aside all of those more abstract things that it becomes really personal when you say mm -hmm. this could be devastating for your town, your community, your neighbors, not only through the direct loss of jobs, but just everything that nuclear plants provide. They truly are economic engines. Well, I, th I think that's a great case. Um, well, uh, I really appreciate your time. I mean, could you just uh, give people a quick pitch um, for the campaign for a green nuclear deal and let people know who, who might be interested in helping out support um, the work that y'all are doing over there? Uh, tell them where they can go. Yeah. So like I said, I was kind of, I was very tired of constantly feeling like I was on my back foot and I didn't see anyone articulating a vision for what practical but optimistic nuclear growth in America could look like. So I started the campaign for a green nuclear deal to talk about how we can best right the ship to get that decarb, that scaled up decarbonization that we know based on history, is absolutely possible with nuclear. So we do things like just talk to people about to bust those misconceptions, to make the case for nuclear. We talk to politicians about repealing moratoria, opening themselves up to opportunities from the nuclear industry for their coal power plant replacements. Um, just basically whatever we can do to help build nuclear, help start building nuclear in the U.S. So right now I'm completely independent of big NGO money or any energy industry interests. It's just my Patreon and like a few subscribers to my brand new Substack, Splitting the Atom. So you can check me out on Patreon, Campaign for a Green Nuclear Deal or Substack, uh, mattyhilly.substack.com. Um, and I would appreciate any and all support because I think this work is really important. I totally agree. We'll be, uh, Left Reckoning will be sure to join up on uh, the Patreon uh, very soon. Um, Matty Healy, I really do appreciate uh, you taking some some time to, uh, to you know to chat with uh, with me, and hopefully uh, we can do this again in the future because um, there's a lot of uh, things I think that uh, still need to be said. I would love that. Thank you for having me on. I'd love to be on anytime. Hell yeah.